Well, hello students, it's Mrs. Cole. Today we're going to, going to be learning about a really fun topic to learn about, and that is called poetry. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever heard of poetry. If you don't know what I'm talking about, give me a thumbs down. Well, hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to give me two thumbs up. And you're going to be so inspired by this that you're going to want to go out and write a whole bunch of poems yourself. Well, let's begin with what exactly is poetry? Poetry is a text that is focused on expressing thoughts, feelings, and emotions by using certain stylistic elements. And I know that sounds like a lot of information, but just know it's a lot simpler than what that sounds like. But just know it truly is about emotions. They're powerful words that can make you sad, happy, excited, curious. It's all by just the way that a person thinks about words and expresses their words creates great poetry. Poetry is also used to, it could be used to inform, but typically it's used to entertain as they express those thoughts and feelings. And some of the vocabulary, we've got a lot of vocabulary to learn as we talk about poetry, but you're gonna be using such things as lines and stanzas, rhythm and rhyme, and a lot of figurative language. So what exactly is this poetry? Well, here's our poetry tree that gives us some examples. Both as these are specific things that fourth graders will focus on, and these are some things that fifth graders will, will be focusing on. But all students at whatever ages, they need to know that there are different types of poetry and that all poems do not rhyme. Some can be short, some can be long. They can be about any topic. And people who write Poems are called poets. And the purpose is to entertain, describe, or inform. And it expresses feelings. This, in a nutshell, is what poetry is all about. You'll have rhyme, rhythm, beats, or meter. You're going to have line breaks, and you're going to have lots of stanzas. Those are the terms. Fourth graders, in particular, and also second and third graders have learned this too, they need to know what alliteration is, they need to know what similes and metaphors are, and fifth graders are going to learn what palindromes are, puns, and idioms. We'll be using our five senses, and our five senses are our hearing, our seeing, our touching, our tasting, and our smelling, and it doesn't matter which order those come in. So again, what is poetry? If you had to explain this to someone, what would you tell them? Well, poetry is a collection of words that express emotion, ideas, and sometimes um, provide a specific meaning, sound, or a rhythm. So poetry, there's a lot involved to this stuff, isn't there? So we're going to be learning about what is a stanza, again, what is a line, what is rhyme, what is the meter, what is the rhythm, the theme, the mood, and this figurative language. Well, as we begin our topic of study on poetry, we're going to be reviewing and kind of doing an author study over this fantastic poet. And I know you've read a ton of his work. This man's name is Shel Silverstein. He was a songwriter, he was an author, and he was a poet. He was born on September the 25th, 1930, and he has since passed on. He died on May the 10th of 1999. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, and he died in Key West, Florida. We are so grateful for Shel Silverstein, who spent his life using his thoughts to create images in our minds and make reading poetry so much fun. He has a specific style, which you probably are aware of. He likes to create very silly characters that do a lot of silly things, and he likes to make us laugh. So this is a perfect picture of him because that's what his poetry is all designed to do. He also likes to write things that make people stop to think and 
to reevaluate maybe the way that they're living their life. There is one book in particular that I hope you've read. It's called The Giving Tree. If you haven't read it, I would suggest that you read it. I give it two thumbs up from Mrs. Coli. So some of his different um, books that he's created or that he created during his lifetime are called Everything on, on It, also Runny Babbitt, and Falling Up Special Edition. This is one of his poems from his book called Falling Up. And it reads like this. This is his typical style, and he does his own illustrations too, as you can see. It's, he's the poet, and he did the drawings himself. So he's not only an author, songwriter, and a poet, but he's also an illustrator. You can tell he's a very creative man, or was a very creative man. Falling up, I tripped on my shoelace and I fell up. Up to the rooftops, up over the town, up past the treetops, up over the mountains, up where the colors blend into the sounds. But it got me so dizzy, when I looked around, I got sick to my stomach and I, and I threw down. Isn't that funny? Okay, so, other books that he he has written are called Where the Sidewalk Ends. This is probably one of my most favorite books that he wrote. He also wrote A Light in the Attic and The Giving Tree, which I already talked about. This here is going to show you one of his poems from Where the Sidewalk Ends and is going to define what exactly a, st a stanza is. You're gonna notice that it's a group of lines that come together as we write stories, we would call it paragraphs, but when talking about poetry, these lines that have meaning with a break in between are called stanzas. So it reads like this. There is a place where the sidewalk ends and before the street begins, and there the grass grows soft and white, and there the sun burns crimson bright, and there the moonbird rests from his, his flight to cool the peppermint wind, Okay, so I'd like you to come sit with me under the poetry with Shel Silverstein. And we're going to learn from him some of these different poetic terms from his actual works that he created as a poet. The first thing we need to become aware of is what is rhyme schemes? Well, students, they're actually rhythm patterns. Poets rhyme the last words in the line, to get, line together. It creates patterns like the ABAB pattern or the AABB pattern, or the ABBA pattern, and even the ABCA pattern. Sounds like we're talking about the alphabet, huh? Or some math. But believe it or not, the poets use that, um, this, these patterns to help them rhyme, rhyme words at the end of their lines, which we call sentences in our regular um, written work. So this is a poem that he wrote, and it's called Pancake. And it's so funny, here it goes. Who wants a pancake, sweet and piping hot? Good little Grace looks up and says, I'll take the one on top. Who else wants a pancake fresh off the griddle? Terrible Teresa smiles and says, I'll take the one in the middle. So you can see he wants us to laugh as we think about his words. Well, if you're wondering what type of pattern is this poem that he wrote, we would call it a quatrain. And it's the rhyme pattern that follows the ABCB pattern. So you can see we have pancake on the end, we have hot, and we have says. So that would represent the A, B, C, and then you can see it goes back to the B. So hot and top would be the rhyming words. And then we would start again. This would be our A, this would be our B, and this would be our C, and this would be our B, middle and griddle rhyme. So again, this is called a quatrain. Great example to Mr. Shell Silverstein. Okay, another term that we need to know as poets is the word alliteration. Can you say that with me, please? Say alliteration, good. This would be very similar to our tongue twisters, like she sells seashells by the seashore. So we're repeating the S sound over and over again. That's, that's what makes a great tongue twister. So that's what alliteration is. The same sound at the beginning of a word is used repeatedly. Most of you are very familiar with this poetic style. Are you familiar with onomatopoeias? I think you are. So in onomatopoeias, that's where words come out that you really can't find in the dictionary, but yet they add like the sound sensation 
to whatever it is that that you want um, to be part of your your poem or your story. So an example would be from A Light in the Attic by Shel Silverstone, and it's called Push Button. I push the light switch button and click the light goes on. I push the lawnmower button and boom, it mows the lawn. I push the root beer button and whoosh, it fills my cup. I push the glove compartment button, clack, it opens up. I push the TV button and zap, there's Wyatt Earp. I push my belly button, burp. Okay, so again, onomatopoeia are the sounds that we can hear by the author of the poet's voice. And it's usually not found in a dictionary, um, but it's, it's to bring life to whatever it is that we're reading. Then we have what's called a limerick, and that's a five line poem. And this is an example from Falling Up by Shel Silverstein, and it's called The Castle. It's the fabulous castle of now. You can walk in and wander about, but it's so very thin once you are, then you've been. And soon as you're in, you're out. So remember with limericks, it has to have syllables and it has to have um, just the five lines. And so he created that with the castle. Then we have rhythm. This comes from the book called Falling Up by Shel Silverstein. And it's going to have rhythm and rhyme and see if you can figure out his rhythm and rhyme. Tattoo and Ruth is the name of the, the title of this poem. Collars and choking, pants are expensive, jackets are itchy and hot. So tattooing Ruth, tattooed me a suit. Now folks think I'm dressed when I'm not. Wow. That's a little bit too explicit for me. Okay, what about this poem? It's called Free Verse, and this comes from Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. You can see that when, we, when you use this style called Free Verse of Poetry, you can create your words in all kinds of shapes and designs to give you a visual, like it's a visual of something that you're trying to represent. And then we have what's called imagery. And this is from Falling Up by, again, Shel Silverstein. And the title of the poem is called New World. See if you can picture using um, your senses what he's trying to describe to you with his imagery. Upside down trees swinging free, buses float and buildings dangle. Now and then it's nice to see the world from a different angle. Isn't that cute? Could you picture what he was saying by his words? I sure could. Okay, we have also talked about a specific style called metaphors and idioms and similes and those kind of things. So this falls into figurative language. So what we're going to notice here in this poem from A Light in the Attic by Shel Silverstein, he's going to describe a hot dog through using all of these types of words and see if you can actually picture this, what the hot dog would look like in your, in your mind's eye just from his words. That's what a a good metaphor does. Hot dog. I have a hot dog for a pet, the only kind my folks would let me get. He does smell sort of bad, and yet he absolutely never gets the sofa wet. We have a butcher for a vet, the strangest vet you've ever met. Guess you're the weirdest family yet to have a hot dog for a pet. That's strange, isn't it? But you could totally picture how this hot dog could represent maybe like a wiener dog. And, and so he, he wanted us to use this hot dog, using the words hot dog to, to understand what he's trying to create as a pet in figurative language. And then we have what's called an epitaph. So we're going to be learning just really quickly about one other different poet that's very popular. And his name is Jack Prolutsky. Can you say that with me? Jack Prolutsky. So he's well known for writing a book called The New Kid on the Block. And his style of poetry is very similar to um, Shel Silverstein in, in, in the fact that they like to write about creatures that make us laugh. This would be an example of his poem. If you were a rhinoceros, if you were a rhinoceros, I still would be your friend. And if you were a platypus, our friendship would not end. I'd like you as a walrus, camel, cat, or kangaroo. It doesn't matter what you are. 
I'll still be friends with you. I love that. The nice thing about Jack Prolutsky, again, he likes to create a lot of thought in his poems. And they can make us cry. They can make us laugh. They can la make us um, think about um, the value of friendship, so the theme of friendship. But this is a poem that he wrote, wrote from Read Aloud Rhymes for the Very Young, and it's called On Top of Spaghetti. And this one's to make us laugh. It reads, on top of, sp of spaghetti all covered with cheese, I lost my poor meatball when somebody sneezed. It rolled off the table and onto the floor, and then my poor meatball rolled right out the door. It rolled in a garden and under a bush. Now my poor meatball was nothing but mush. The mush was as tasty as tasty could be. Only next summer it grew into a tree. The tree was all covered with beautiful moss. It grew lovely meatballs in a tomato sauce. So if you like spaghetti all covered with cheese, hold on to your meatballs and don't ever sneeze. Chew! Is that not a funny one? So you can see he has a creative style about him too. Another book that he wrote is called It's Raining Pigs and Noodles. So if you like this style of poetry, all you have to do is ask your local librarian. And she has tons of these styles of books just for you. Now in closing, I know that we're all familiar with Dr. Seuss. He's written hundreds and hundreds of books that make us laugh and make us think and have helped us learn how to read. Um, the nice thing about Dr. Seuss is he has a poetic style that he can actually, um, that he actually used to write picture books. And it was the rhythm and rhyme that we enjoyed as kids. And this book is a fun one. It's called All the Places You'll Go. And the nice thing about this book is it helps us to understand that new experiences can be both exciting and overwhelming at times. And it starts with these words, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off on your way. And boys and girls, I know that you too are going to go many places and they're gonna be great places. So I am so excited for you and I wish you also congratulations as you become an exceptional poet and as you practice using your different rhythm and rhyme your different skills that you're learning at school and at home and becoming a very creative author. And I know that as you practice, it'll make you perfect. And someday all oh, the places that you'll go to and someday I will hopefully have the opportunity to read one of your famous books too. Well, until next time, remember to be great readers and especially great writers of poetry. I know you can do it until next time. Bye-bye.